Hi everyone. Good morning. We're gonna get started. So thanks all for coming today. My name is Christina Raymond Murphy. I'm the Open and Affordable Educational Resources Librarian at Penn State University at the Abington campus. Hi, I'm Brian Geary. I'm the Learning Design and Open Education Engagement Librarian at uh, Penn State University, and I work on the opposite side of Pennsylvania and near Pittsburgh. And our third presenter is not here today, Elizabeth Nelson. She is at Penn State Lehigh Valley. We have a bunch of other names up there um, because those are the we're talking about a program where we're training and upscaling OER education across librarians at Penn State University. Um, so some things are going to go over today. Um, overview of the program, we call it OER Leads, how our timeline goes and what kind of funding model we have. We're going to discuss our goals and our, hope, our intended impact um, for this program share some of our obstacles and our opportunities um, in creating the program and managing this project, some impact, and then we'll share a QR code with access to our materials. Um, so the background of um, this program, um, as you all know, you're all here, libraries are often leaders in the open education movement. Um, however, it might, there's capacity issues and how to scale this up um, across our institutions. Um, Brian and I, you know, Penn State is lucky enough we have two OER librarians, um, but we're a pretty big institution, so um, even that can be a big issue of scale and capacity. Um, there's obviously certification and training programs for librarians around Creative Commons and OER. Brian and I have done many of them. Um, of course, they require time, fees, um, but they also, we're looking to run an adoption program or scale up our adoption program. And so they also, some of them lack the like practical training and the logistics of managing an adoption program. So that's really what our program is aimed at. Um, so we address that side of it. Um, Penn State or Pennsylvania, I should say, is not as lucky as some of the other states in the United States that have legislation um, behind them that help propel OER forward. We do not have that. Yeah. So you're speaking at Colorado right here, your presentation. I'm like, I want to hear that because that's what we need that. Um, so that is an issue for our state. There's no legislation that pushes OER forward. So we're kind of just groundwork doing it up. Um, so um, to give an idea of our context, um, this is the state of Pennsylvania on the East Coast or coast-ish of the states. Um, we currently have 10, those are all of our campuses. We have 24 campuses. Um, Pennsylvania, or I should say Scotland, is about two-thirds the size of Pennsylvania. Um, so that's where we are in terms of, uh, we're, there were one of hundreds of uh, institutions of higher education in Pennsylvania, but we're the largest in our state. We're the land-grant institution. Um, we have 88,000 students, about 6,300 faculty, um, and about 150 librarians that work at Penn State. Um, so Brian and I are just two of the 150. Um, so that being said, Pennsylvania is a kind of like interesting state, as many are. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner near the Abington campus, that's where Philadelphia is. On the far left side, over by Greater Allegheny, that's where Pittsburgh is. So those are, you know, two large cities, the two biggest cities, um, with Harrisburg, another one in the middle. And then the rest of Pennsylvania is really, really rural. So um, our campuses range from very diverse to not very diverse from 40,000 students to 500 students. Um, each of them has a library at them and each of them has at least one librarian. Um, and a lot of our campuses, the, the flagship campuses in the center is University Park. Um, that has a very different socioeconomic situation from the rest of the campuses. Um, at my campus at Abington, 42% of our students are Pell Grant eligible, which means their families are living um, below the poverty line. So that really impacts. Um, so that's an interesting thing because at a land grant institution or a place with multiple campuses, oftentimes things are driven top down. Um, but in this case at Penn State, OER has come from like, sort of grassroots up because the greatest need is at, tends to be at the campuses we call the Commonwealth campuses, as opposed to at the flagship campus. Um, so that's kind of been an interesting part of ours as well. Um, Okay, so what is OER Leads? Um, well, it's funded by um, two pieces of funding. We have an endowment at the University Libraries. We have a really strong donor system at University Libraries at Penn State. Um, and one of our donors donated the Librarianship for Learning Innovations, which I received two years ago. So that has given me funding to do this. Um, so that's one way. We also, uh, two years ago, our dean asked for proposals for Giving Tuesday campaign. Um, and I proposed an OER one and she accepted it. So our first time doing it, we have raised $45,000 um, from one Giving Tuesday campaign. 
I think we were the second largest Giving Tuesday campaign at our campus. There was like, at, at, sorry, at our university, there was like 150 Giving Tuesday campaigns at Penn State. Only the law school beat us out, which uh, wasn't necessarily unexpected, but <laughs> so that's how we raised money. We did it again last year and we raised $37,000. So we continue to have donors that are interested in OER and this speaks to them. Um, the one thing that I found that's interesting for donors that speaks to them is their return on their investment, which is not language. I'm an English major working with donors and all this stuff feels very uncomfortable for me. Um, but there's definitely a language there about how, you know, your $500 donation has an ongoing impact because faculty keep using OER. So that has really been good at getting that across. Um, so what do we do? It's a train the trainer model for OER adoption. Brian, myself and Elizabeth Nelson, the other librarian who's not here. We develop materials, we train our librarians. Um, they also go through the Creative Commons certificate. So part of the funding that I have, we pay for them to do that. We were trying to keep our own scalability issues there. Like we can't train everything on OER, so we sign them up for that. And then we form a community of practice and we work together over a few months. I'll show you the timeline in a second. And then they immediately put their skills to practice running an adoption program at their campus. So not only do they get funding um, for themselves a stipend the librarians, but then they receive up to five stipends for faculty at their campuses to support them in doing OER. So, um, so this is just the timeline real quick. Um, in the spring 22, we, 2022, we created the training manual and began onboarding the first cohort in January. Um, we did that for a couple months. That's when they took the Creative Commons certificate. And then by March, they were putting out the call at their campuses for faculty to apply to receive an adoption grant. Um, in summer 2022, they began supporting their faculty over the summer, as I'm sure all of you know. Um, that could be a wide range of things, anywhere from the faculty who says, great, I looked in the open textbook library, got something, good to go, right? Um, to faculty that needed much more support um, and changing all of their course materials. And then the fall and the spring, the courses started being taught. For the first round of this, we had, um, 17 faculty teaching 34 campuses, um, supported by the seven librarians that we that were the OER leads. Um, and then spring, we're right now in the middle of training three new librarians applied for the program, and they'll be running their courses, um, and so on and so forth. We've also, because of the fundraising that we did, we're able to continue it for the initial leads as well. So now we're gonna have 10 librarians running programs at their campuses. And I'm gonna turn it over to Brian. Thank you. Um, so in terms of some of the goals and impact that we've had uh, thus far with the program, uh, as Christine already alluded to, um, this idea of building a, a larger, stronger network of folks who have some uh, open education expertise is certainly something that we were interested in doing and having more um, point people across the, the whole Penn State ecosystem uh, for OER support and advocacy, especially at that campus level. Um, also, uh, sort of one of the, the immediate outcomes of all of this was to have uh, these OER adoption programs at all of these different campuses. So we've, we have that happening at eight different campuses. Um, I won't read through all of the campuses, but you, you can see them on the map earlier there. Um, and uh, this has had an immediate you know, impact on students, uh, just some Initial cost savings calculations there, we estimated about a little under $32,000 for 731 students in 35 courses taught by 30 faculty. Um, the second year of the program is underway right now. Uh, they're starting to recruit faculty for it. And so that's going to expand to two additional Commonwealth campuses as well as, as, well as into um, some additional programs at the main University Park campus. Um, and then uh, a final goal of this is to have some adaptable materials that can be used um, at you know, our various Penn State campuses, but also be used at uh, additional institutions and we will share those with you shortly. So uh, we've gathered feedback from a number of different stakeholders in this uh, program. Um, first of all, being the, the Leeds librarians themselves. Um, and uh, one of the things that they've uh, really enjoyed about the program is having this kind of sense of community around this particular topic. A lot of them were coming to this with very little 
prior knowledge or expertise around open education. And so having uh, other folks who were kind of in the same boat and being able to rely upon each other, learn from each other is uh, very important for them. Um, they all had a, had a great experience in the uh, Creative Commons uh, certificate program. So that, that was a good thing that came out of that. Um, and one thing that, that uh, was really important in terms of their relationship with faculty was that, uh, first of all, there were some faculty who had never uh, interacted with librarians in the first, like previous to, to this program. And, um, and so having that kind of one-on-one -on -one experience with uh, some of the faculty was a, a new thing for um, some of the, the, the faculty and the librarians. Um, also, uh, there were some challenges that came out of all of this. So trying to navigate some of the, the faculty needs and expectations. There were uh, courses where it was difficult to find materials for them. I, I encountered that actually my, myself uh, with one of the courses that, that applied for the program. Um, and then there were also some instances where classes got canceled kind of at the last minute. I actually had one that got canceled a couple of weeks before the semester started. Fortunately, the, the class that this faculty member uh, got reassigned to, we were able to find OER for that. So that kind of all worked out, but it, it was challenging um, in that respect. Um, also, the, the lead said that they, sorry, I'm not sure why it's, <laughs> um, the, the leads uh, said that they were, you know, interested in uh, having some more case studies to, to take a look at to, to learn. Okay, so we're going to share um, some initial survey results that we have from the courses that ran this past fall. Um, there, there are still some more courses that are running right now in the spring, but uh, not surprisingly, our, our survey of students surfaced a lot of concerns around affordability. Um, and so 54% indicated that they were worried about paying for course materials. 65 were anxious about their ability to afford being a Penn State student. 35 uh, skipped purchasing course materials at some point. I, I don't think those numbers are, are uh, particularly earth shattering if you know, you've looked at any other studies around um, uh, students as it relates to textbook affordability. Um, all of this has had an impact on their academic success. So 21% said that they've struggled with the course because they didn't have access to the materials and 9% had even either dropped a course or withdrawn from a course as a result. Um, but in addition to the cost concerns, students emphasized that ease of access was a major concern for them. Um, and so we were pleased to see that 97% of the students said that uh, OER were about the same or easier to access than other course materials that, they, that they've used. And um, interestingly, cost and ease of access were the top two concerns also for the faculty um, when we served surveyed them um, as far as their motivations for being a part of this program. And they were uh, also interested in learning more about OER. So that was another reason for uh, participating in the program. Um, they also gave us some insights into the effectiveness of the materials. Uh, and um, perhaps most importantly, 100% of them said that students understood the materials as well or um, uh, as, as previous materials that they had used. Um, so this suggests that, you know, the materials aren't detrimental to student learning, and <laughs> which is good. Um, and in many cases is actually providing added benefit to uh, student learning. Also, 73% of the faculty said that they thought the quality of the materials was the same or higher than what they had previously used. So that, that was good to see. Um, and consequently, 87% of them said that they would uh, continue to use OER in the future, which is good because, you know, we're making this one-time investment in the faculty and they'll continue to uh, have kind of compounding effects there. Um, one thing worth mentioning about the labor aspect of this is that, you know, it can take a lot of work. Um, and in this case, 40% said that it was more work than they expected. Um, and so this is an important thing to, to keep in mind for a variety of reasons. Um, one, you know, it's important to, if you're doing something like this, to manage uh, faculty expectations in terms of, you know, how much work this is going to uh, require to be able to, to make these changes and how much time it's going to take. Um, 
But it's also important to us from like an advocacy perspective, um, because at least at our institution, I would imagine a lot of other folks institutions, this kind of work isn't typically given the same kind of weight in annual reviews or promotion and tenure and all of that sort of stuff as, you know, research or other types of activities. So um, that's, you know, kind of a risk for faculty to invest a lot of time and effort into this uh, as opposed to something else that's going to get them more credit, uh, so to speak. Um, and that's particularly a risk for uh, contingent faculty who also happen to be some of our biggest adopters of, of OER. Um, and, uh, and that lack of credit really ends up being kind of an equity issue. And um, so it's important for us to, to advocate for this. And we've been doing some of that at, at uh, Penn State um, because we don't want to see this turn into a situation where the only folks who can really be taking that risk are the folks who have tenure, the folks who have more established careers and have less to lose uh, by spending time on this. Um, in addition to our primary goal of getting more faculty to use OER, um, as I alluded to earlier, um, this also had an added benefit of getting more faculty to work with librarians. Um, and in some cases, faculty who had never worked with a librarian previously, um, and that they had um, greater awareness of library resources as a result of this program. So just a few challenges um, that uh, have, have come out of this program. Um, you know, the, the workload capacity issue for, for librarians uh, is certainly challenging um, because these folks are doing lots of other things in addition to, to OER. Um, also, you know, recruiting faculty was a challenge at, at some campuses more than others. We had some campuses that had more than five uh, applicants, which was kind of the number that we had for each allotted to each of the campuses. And then there were other campuses where there were like one or two people. Um, faculty expectations and their understanding of OER. So kind of, uh, again, uh, managing expectations was uh, important and a challenge. Um, sustainability of the program in, in terms of you know funding is, is going to be something that we're going to have to uh, be thinking about especially in the current uh, budget <laughs> climate that we have at Penn State which is not the greatest <laughs> um, and I would imagine it's probably the case for a lot of folks in the room um, and uh, thinking about some opportunities um, you know this has been a great way to make lots of new connections across Penn State's various campuses um, as I said, greater awareness of library resources and OER has come out of this. And um, this has been a great proof of concept for kind of uh, distributing this work across uh, the institution because uh, we have these 24 campuses, but it's one institution. It's not like uh, some of these, you know, like SUNY, for instance, where it's a system, but lots of independent campuses. This is one institution, but just uh, geographically dispersed, I believe is the, the tagline that we have. <laughs> um, but uh, so th this has been a great way to kind of divide up that work uh, across the, uh, the system. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, this has provided a great sense of community for the librarians participating in the program and is helping us to uh, build up our capacity. And there's been an increased interest in open pedagogy out of this. And so we're kind of hoping to move in that direction. So as I promised earlier, we have materials from the program, the, the training manual and um, the uh, dossier letter that, that we've provided to all of the leads to, to be able to give to faculty participate in the program um, and the consultation worksheet that we use as part of this. You can either go to the URL or use the QR code. I'll give you all a moment to grab that. I just wanted to make sure yeah. everybody was able to get it before. <laughs> This 
It looks like you're watching it closely. <laughs> Go ahead and get started. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, good morning, folks. Um, my name is uh, David Tully. Um, I'm the librarian for student success and affordability at um, Carolina State University Libraries. And I'm Will. I'm here to cheerlead for David. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your patience while we got these slides um, underway. There we go. All right. Um, I guess to begin with, then, maybe a little bit of context about where we come from or who we work for, at least. Um, so North Carolina State is a, a, a large research one university in the southeastern United States, situated in Raleigh. Um, historically, we've had, you know, strengths within things like agriculture, textiles, um, engineering, design and statistics. Um, we have about sort of 38,000 students um, enrolled um, at NC State about 80% sort of, of our students are North Carolina residents. And if you're really interested in some of our sort of wow statistics about our university, there will be a go link at the end and you can take a closer look at some of that. In terms of bachelor's degrees, we award um, over 100, I think at the moment, and, and growing. Um, perhaps through um, virtue of being a land grant institution, NC State has this, this motto, this ethos of think and do. So we really value and center sort of hands-on transformative work that looks, looks to problem solve. Um, and I think you know, this motto sort of cuts through across campus, including the university libraries. And speaking of the university, the university libraries, um, the libraries is a heavily used resource um, on campus, both on and off campus. I should say. And for a number of years now, you know, our libraries has acted as one of like the main hubs um, across campus. So, you know, this is a place where students come to research and, and learn, but also where they will gather in their social groups sort of after hours as well. So a really busy um, building. Student success, we've been active, as I said, for many years now, both in terms of things like building hours, resources and services and so on. But certainly over the last few years in particular, the libraries have taken like an, an increased presence from a great stakeholder in the wider scheme of things to the extent that, you know, student success and affordability is uh, number one in our strategic plan of a few years ago. I think the reason why is just the, the ongoing sort of diversification of our campus. I think where in, as in the past, you know, our university was set up for one or two sort of typical students, um, whereas now that sort of that model no longer fits, you know, with greater diversity, with greater access to groups that are, you know, his, to categories of students that are just historically underrepresented in a higher ed. So it brings new challenges and a need to be uh, much more flexible and pivot to meet some of those, um, some of those demands. So as mentioned, sort of one size um, doesn't fit all. And I think that really gets to sort of the heart of some of the work um, that we do and the importance of such. Um, and you know, to throw some statistics at you, sort of um, one in five now of our incoming students are first generation students. This past uh, fall or autumn, one in seven of our incoming students was a transfer student, often transferring from a sort of a rural community college elsewhere within North Carolina. Um, but it's fair to say that a large number of our students arrive at NC State more vulnerable than others to, to, to costs, particularly sort of unforeseen costs that might arise during their sort of four years or whatever it might be on campus. And this, these issues can sort of manifest itself in different ways that affect student success, student outcome. One of the ways in which we've seen recently, and this is a trend that is, is repeated across like new similar institutions in the US, is the rise of sort of food and housing insecurity. Um, so I, I've worked pretty closely with a professor um, on campus, Dr. Mary Haskett um, from psychology. Dr. Haskett has done a lot of research looking at the rates of food and, food and housing insecurity at NC State. 
And what her research showed was that 15% of our students will experience food insecurity at some point during their academic career at NC State, and about 10% experience housing insecurity. And I think it's easy to imagine when you are experiencing sort of, sort of these types of, of cost pressures, that this ha can have an impact on you elsewhere in your, in your um, journey towards your, your degree. Um, it, this can lead to taking longer to complete, therefore accruing more student debt as a result. And about 65% of our students do rely upon some form of financial aid in order to attend, um, or worse altogether, sort of dropping out altogether with nothing to show for it. Now, this is the sticker price of an education, an undergraduate education at NC State. <clears throat> um, you'll see there's a distinction between North Carolina residents, um, sort of in the center, and out of state to the right. So you pay less as an NC resident, but you still pay an awful lot. So over the course of a four-year degree, you'll be looking at around $100,000. That's to get your, get your certificate. Um, now, many students still choose to pursue this despite those increasing costs, because without a degree, um, there's a lot of data which would suggest what you, your income during your career will be significantly less than if you go into the job market without a, deg without a degree, for instance. So for many students, despite these cost pressures, it's still a gamble worth taking. Now, the libraries um, is not in a position where we can impact too many of these costs, but we do have this sort of unique impact, unique ability to impact books and supplies in particular. And we sort of focus a lot of our resources over the last few years on this one aspect in particular. So this year, we ask students to budget about $854 for their materials. That's down from recent years. Um, there's an, another presentation entirely about whether that cost has got cheaper for students or not, centered around things like access codes, student choice, and so on and so forth. And maybe even some of us can have a chat afterwards about that, because I can talk all day about this. But it's still a significant um, cost to the libraries, it's particularly interested in helping out it. But we've been active in student affordability for many years now, so far predating my work here. Beginning really in the year 2000, we began a sort of a relatively small, I'm told, short-term lending program where students would borrow a laptop, or borrow headphones for about four hours a day. Now, fast forward a few years later, uh, we launched a technology lending, uh, uh, sorry, a textbook lending program. So if you are enrolled in a class that has a required textbook, the libraries will purchase a copy and it'll be made available to you on a very short term basis of about sort of two hours per time. Now, given, as we know, the escalating cost of, tech, of textbooks, open education and OER in particular <coughs> are much more uh, of an interest to us. And in 2014, our alt textbook project was launched um, and all the credit in the world to uh, the gentleman to my right here. It's been a, <laughs> it has been a roaring success and I'll come on to talk a little bit more about that. And then in 2018, the library started awarding scholarships. So if you're a student worker at our libraries and we have about 200 to 250 at any time, um, you will be eligible for a scholarship award from the libraries. We started off with two scholarships worth $2,000 piece, so one-fifth of your tuition. And again, I'll come on to talk about how that's grown in recent years. Now, because there are so many different sort of threads and so all these different sort of strands around affordability, this is just barely a handful of them. The libraries developed a fellows position, a time-limited position in 2019, or somebody to lead an initiative, sort of marrying these threads together in a programmatic way and developing new ones. Uh, I was fortunate enough to um, to be the, the person that was tasked with doing that. And I've progressed a few years later onto my current position of student success and affordability. My role, I, I'll be completely honest, I think I've got one of the best jobs in the libraries. I love what I do for a living. One of the reasons why is that our, at our libraries, and I think never more so is that, is that clear than within my role, we are not siloed. We cross, we cross departments all the time. There's, we have about 20 departments at the libraries. I don't think there's one in which I haven't collaborated on at some point just within the past three years. My home department is Open Education, well, the Open Knowledge Centre, I should say. 
So this is where a lot of our sort of OER work takes place. And I think it makes perfect sense to be stationed at home in, in open knowledge, because what OER is a big part of what I do. I think the values and the principles of open education um, really inform a lot of the work that I do, whether it's with uh, my colleagues in development, community engagement, or access services. So, so things like, for instance, um, community. Community is absolutely at the heart of open ed and is at the heart of my, my position. I would be nowhere near as successful if it wasn't for a large amount of people on and off campus that I work with along the way. Innovation and creativity. Um, people in general, openness, sort of trust, that sort of thing. All of these are sort of vital components of this position. And I also get to collaborate sort of elsewhere across this sort of huge campus of ours. Perhaps the best example of that is our Pack Essentials Committee. This is a student sort of basic needs coalition of volunteers. Um, I'm the library's representative, but most of the other units will have a representative. And we are set up to sort of um, serve the basic needs of around that sort of 20% mark of our students who are sort of particularly vulnerable to, um, to costs and unforeseen costs in particular. So we work together, we have ad hoc committees um, and uh, student government is another one. Student voice is really important. You know, we are, we always talk about this, but it's also absolutely paramount to work the work that I do. Um, and then sort of there's other ones as well, sort of wellness and recreation. I think the last few years have showed us that there's absolutely a need to bring in um, outside bodies from elsewhere on campus into our building and actually reach students where they are. So um, I've collaborated closely with the counselling centre with our wellness and rec. We've had things that I thought I would never see before, students getting like massages in the, in the foyer. <laughs> this would never have happened a few years ago. But our libraries is open to, to doing things like this. And my job, luckily I get to help arrange some of that. Now to give you some idea of some of the success stories and, and, and what a position like this can achieve, we have a, 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 a food pantry. Um, hands up if you're on a campus with a food pantry. Several of you. Um, so our food pantry has been around for a while now, about 10 years or so. And you know, it's a vital resource for, for a lot of our students. It's still heavily used, um, perhaps unfortunately so in, in some, some aspects. Uh, the, the libraries has been active in terms of partnering with the pantry for years. You know, we've sent colleagues, myself and Will, have gone to the pantry um, to volunteer. We've also gone out into the community to help with um, other food pantries. But again, in line with that idea of opening up our spaces to incorporate this more sort of holistic set of needs that students need these days, we've began bringing the pantry into our spaces to do sort of pop-up events. Um, and it doesn't stop there either. We've given our rates of food and housing insecurity. We've hosted things like town halls where we've brought in sort of um, authors, we've brought in academics, we've brought in students who can speak firsthand to their experiences and what we need to do better on campus to support our students. We've held film series that look specifically at things like students from lower income backgrounds accessing higher ed and, um, and being successful within it. We've published white papers on this topic. We also have a, uh, a personal librarian program on our campus. So if you are an incoming student, and this fall we had close to 7,000 students, you are automatically paired. You don't get to choose, but you can opt out if you want to, with one of our librarians. And the idea of this is um, you have a, like a, a person at the library, so a contact, a concierge, where you can reach out to at any time and ask a question, both about the libraries, but also about campus in general. And we outreach to you both in, you know, through things like email, but also in-person events. And our goal really <laughs> is to, um, <laughs> to humanise the libraries. And sort of um, you know, for a lot of our students, our, our libraries is this like, enormous like, behemoth of a building um, that can be quite intimidating to step into, particularly if you are from a smaller town or a rural community. You know, you come into our library, it's not immediately obvious like if you found your place or not. So the goal of our program is to sort of hopefully sort of kick away some of those barriers 
by showing there's a more sort of personal touch. We're not afraid to laugh at ourselves, um, but we're also there when you need like serious help with your research or access to technology, whatever it might be. A great commercial. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We, we did several of them. We um, did a few sort of takes on things like The Office and everything else. And I'm awaiting a call from Hollywood that hasn't come yet. <laughs> um, I've also done an awful lot of work with our development department um, in a few different ways. So I mentioned the student scholarships previously. We started off with two in 2018. Uh, we have now awarded 37 <coughs> since and 21 just within the last two years. Um, and 12 of our students benefited from those scholarships in the past year. Half of them received awards of about $5,000, so about half the cost of, of tuition. We've been able to do this through philanthropy, um, through growing the number of different types of scholarships that are available to our students. Um, donors have been great, they've been, they've been central, um, and also the Libraries Alt Textbook project has also benefited from things like crowdfunding. We raised $7,000 just last month to support faculty in OER projects. The main reason, I think one of the best successes that we've done, uh, sort of provoke some of that, is through them being able to demonstrate the impact of a, of a scholarship award to things like storytelling through, through whether it's videos, whether it's connecting um, over lunch with students, or if you see in the middle here, we had a, a donors and scholars program in person at the libraries last month. So this helps both steward existing gifts, but also cultivate new ones as well. Also been extremely successful in grant writing. So working with foundations to bring money in that I can then um, use so I can pay for students' textbooks or access codes. I can buy students' laptops if they are in, in sort of dire need of, of access to that regard as well. Our Alt Textbook program, it would be remiss of me not to mention this because this has been like perhaps the biggest success of student affordability over the past 10 years. We've estimated since 2014, we've saved close to $11 million. That's a conservative estimate in fairness in that time and already out of date given the applications we've already received this semester as well. We've had impact of over 80,000 students, which is amazing. Um, and at 77 projects within that time, but 45 within the last um, sort of three or four years. So since that fellows position was developed, it's really sort of provided a sense of, I think, of sort of rocket fuel um, to this type of program. We've been able to grow the number of applications that we receive quite significantly. We also have this amazing program called the Open Pedagogy Incubator. Um, now, Will and I are leading another uh, presentation tomorrow where we dive into the incubator. So uh, I won't give you too, too many spoilers, but if you're curious what this is referring to, this is a program that's set up to, um, to support faculty in developing competencies in open pedagogy through things like workshops, through things like um, discussions, curated readings, and so on. So um, we've had sort of multiple cohorts come through the incubator over the past few years, both at a local level, but also a system-wide level as well. And I'm certainly excited to talk to, to a few of you tomorrow more about that. And also um, digital access as well. So I mentioned at the very beginning, we've had that short-term lending program for a number of years. And that was great, but there was you know, a growing number of students where that did not benefit any longer through a variety of reasons. Um, be it um, employment, be it they were no longer accessing campus as frequently as students did in the past, be it they may have had sort of um, parent or, or other caregiver responsibilities. So this program I've grown to be um, a subsection of longer term lending. And that's also been um, scaled a little bit more to incorporate Wi-Fi hotspots as well for students who don't have any or reliable internet access at least as well. And finally, um, another success, you know, we provide, you know, needs-based scholarships, but so do a lot of our other colleges. We have 11 on campus. So we've partnered with a couple of them 
whereby students are receiving aid from those scholarships, but we tack on additional library support. So we provide an additional laptop on a longer term basis. We'll purchase textbooks and access codes um, uh, for the first year. So essentially ease that sort of that, that landing students have when they first come to campus and they leave a high school where these materials are commonly made available to them. And suddenly they're being asked to find $300 by an access code for three months that they can't sell back. So these are my slides. I want to acknowledge we have five minutes left and I want to make sure we get to some questions. So I'll just say a lot of people in the room are doing really cool stuff like this and we're excited to talk about different ways, whether that's sort of a distributed expertise where you have different folks on campus coming together in a constellation, whether you're trying to sort of build a Voltron David where you take the different parts and bring them together as a, as a team in different ways, or whether you want to think about a full-time position, our position description is available and David can speak really powerfully to these issues. I could blather on forever. If you've ever been to a past <laughs> session, you know that's the case. But I'd really like to invite you all to come back and to have a little time for Q&A here. So thank you all so much. Thank you, David, for that awesome discussion. What questions do you have? That was very abrupt. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, can you expand a bit on how this went with faculty and how you kind of engage them with workshops or I just know I'm in the starting um, process. So uh, any hints or strategies to get them going at that to get them on board? Yeah, so awareness is always is always a challenge sort of, sort of a, as we know, not just of OER, but also the ways in which the libraries can support faculty in both, you know, understanding OER in terms of discovery, but also potentially using it to sort of transform their course. A few things that, that we've done is um, we've had sort of workshop series. So we did the Open Cafe for a number of years. It started during the during lockdown, which was a sort of a synchronous on, you know, um, virtual event where week to week we would sort of meet and we'd explore a different topic of open education. Uh, so we've done that. We had a few different sort of series of that sort of as it were that proved quite popular. Obviously, workshop-wise, um, we've tried to sort of position our workshops to speak to the reasons why faculty don't embrace UE, uh, OER, for instance. So, for you know, as we know, you know, the quality question, right, always comes up. So that's one that we've done. Discovery is perhaps another one. And also, a lot of faculty aren't aware that if you work with the libraries through the old textbook program, it's a grant funding program as well. So you receive funding that will compensate you for your time, or you can use it in different ways, hiring a student, what it, what, it might, what it might be. But we also reach outside of the libraries to work with some of my partners across campus to draw awareness to this as well. Student government's a good example of that. Um, over the past few years, we've worked with them to develop um, a faculty award around sort of OER as well. So speaking to that promotion and tenure um, component that we always know is, is, is a, an issue when it comes to faculty working with we are and things like that. So there's a lot of different ways. And I think the pivot to online as it opened up some additional opportunities that were always there, but maybe we didn't always see, see the value in them. The only thing I'd add to that is you're in a room full of people doing cool stuff who would love to share, who would love to talk to you, who have an open license on all their stuff. When I first started and didn't know anything, I reached out to several people in this room and said, I don't know what I'm doing. And they gave me rubrics and promotional emails and posters and everything else. Please do that too. We'd all really love to share. <clears throat> um, I would like to know if you use other incentives uh, uh, than affordability yeah. to uh, disseminate the idea of using OER. Absolutely, absolutely. So I mean, I bought, when I have my discussions with faculty, affordability is an important component of it, but it, it really has to go further than that. I think it's really about the open license, about the opportunity to do something different that you don't find with all rights reserved, tailor content um, towards the way that faculty teach their course in the, in the way that they want to teach it. Um, but also talk about things like, you know, equity and everything else and inclusion, which is really, you know, something that's really important on our campus at the moment. But I certainly think if the conversation began and ended with affordability, we would not get anywhere near as many projects working with OERs we currently do. So it's really about exciting them about the potential of the Creative Commons license and the way that they can do things better than they currently are in terms of their pedagogy. Do you all want to share anything 
from your work in terms of getting faculty invested? Or? Um, I mean, we just had a, we did a presentation to our, I guess, a, a, a conference on campus, a, the flagship campus. And one faculty said, like, yeah, affordability is nice, but I really, he was excited by what you can yeah. transform. And the idea of actually students being part of it and contributing back to knowledge was what really spoke to, spoke to some of the faculty. So that, you know, that is always exciting to hear that because it allows you to have such bigger conversations. So. Yeah. Time for one more question. How do you communicate? How do you get the word out? Okay, I'll email you. Yeah. <laughs> That's, we have that same face. Thank you. <laughs> I think we have a lot of strategies that we can talk about. It is the top of the hour, and I know there's another group of people coming in. So thank you all again. This was a really cool discussion, and we're so excited to keep talking. Thank you very much. Great job. Thanks,